Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Dear brothers and sisters, since the beginning of Lent until now, we have prepared our hearts by penance and charitable works. Today we gather together to herald with the whole Church the beginning of the celebration of our Lord's Paschal Mystery, that is to say, of His Passion and Resurrection. For it was to accomplish this mystery that he entered his own city of Jerusalem. And so we pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who as an example of humility for the human race to follow, caused our Saviour to take flesh and submit to the cross, graciously grant that we may heed his lesson of patient suffering and so merit a share in his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The servant of the Lord said, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. The Word of the Lord. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When they come in Jerusalem, and it reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this. The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the fall of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them, and brought the donkey and the colt, and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees, and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him, and that followed, were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth and Galilee. This is the Gospel of Christ. North Africa in the 4th century became the cockpit of a terrible dilemma for the Christian Church. The Roman Empire had recently legitimated the Christian faith, a dramatic change from the terrible persecutions it had dished out just before that. Now, two categories of Christians uneasily faced each other. There were those who were given away under persecution to save themselves and their families. And there were those who had stuck with it and who had watched people close to them being martyred. Eventually, the tension became unbearable, and the church split into the Donatists, the hardliners, who said that there should be no readmittance for the backsliders, and the Catholics, who were prepared to give a welcome to those who let the side down after they had done their penance. At first, the Catholics were very much in the minority, until the pugnacious St. Augustine came along and outwitted, overmastered, and out-argued the Donatists. The Church, he said, should be a school for sinners as well as a training ground for saints. 
He used the parable of the wheat and the tares to point out that until Judgment Day, the church would contain a mixture of heroes and shirkers and quiet, faithful ones. And often, it wouldn't be clear who was who until God finally sorted everything out. Meanwhile, we should give each other the benefit of the doubt and just assume that we were all under the mercy and the judgment of God. The dilemma repeats itself again and again in the life of the church. It is hardly surprising that because this situation occurred right at the start. If these had been normal times and we were able to have the Palm Sunday liturgy in its fullness, we would have just heard the story of a group of people who couldn't go the distance, who in Matthew's version let their inspiring friend down and who at different stages in the story betray him. Judas has decided to sail Jesus down the river before the story even starts. Sitting at the table with the leader, he's very disappointed in. He's already decided in his heart that he's had enough. All that is needed now is the appropriate time and place to do the deed. Three of the disciples have decided to go with Jesus into that terrible, endless night and stick it out to the end. But they fall asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. They leave their friend terribly alone as he waits in these final hours of freedom, wondering if he should make a run for it, hoping that God will provide a way out, digging down deep into the final resources of courage to accept the Father's will. When the arrest is made, they let it and remove themselves from the passion narrative. Peter manages to make it into the next stage of the story. Maybe he fell asleep too, but he grits his teeth and tags along into that famous courtyard, hoping like heck that there'll be a rescue attempt, human or divine, to reverse the situation. When that doesn't happen, he gives up also. More than all the others, he realizes with bitter regret how far he has fallen from his original intentions. Nobody would seem gets off the hook in this story. The Jewish religious authorities loathe and despise the Romans, but that doesn't stop them colluding with their local representative and manipulating him into a hanging party. And Pilate, who's supposed to be the impartial responsibility figure who stands above the local petty squabbling, gives way under pressure despite the clear warning from his wife to stay out of it. Where this story finds us, locates us, connects with us, will often be at the point of our own betrayals. We would be unusual Christians if there weren't times when we let the side down, went back on our promises, silently colluded with dishonesty, or even deliberately turned our back on God and his call on us as we were filled with a spirit of rebellion and disobedience. We too are the community of traitors, the company of betrayers, living out again and again the pattern of the story that will be before us this Holy Week. But God has thought of all this, has anticipated the likely outcome of our faltering attempts to follow in the way. There is a new way of doing things in this household that addresses the situation. It is called forgiveness. In our society, we're always hearing about people moving on after setbacks. We're always hearing sayings like, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It rather indicates that people are not disposed to plumb the depths of their moral failures or to linger on the implications of why they went wrong. And sometimes, when people do fess up and take the rap for what they've done, they do it in such an arrogant way that you would wonder if they'd learned anything. In our Christian way of doing things, the assumption is that when you confess your betrayals and put yourself into the hands of Christ the healer with sorrow and contrition, then the place of moral failure becomes the place of moral and spiritual regeneration. Brother Williams used to say to us at Murfield that the sacrament of failure teaches us things that we would never learn any other way. It obliges us to leave behind the superficiality, the glibness, the laziness, and the easy compromises that let us and everybody else down. It obliges us to live at a greater depth and to rely more on the mercy and cleansing judgment of God.
Where Judas went wrong was in assuming that there was no way back from his terrible sin and the mercy and forgiveness of God. Where the Donatists went wrong was in assuming that Christianity is a competitive event in which only heroes and martyrs set the minimum standard of belonging. Where Augustine and the Catholics were right was in their assumption that forgiveness is the charter of the Church. What qualified Peter to move into the top slot in the Church's leadership was his willingness to begin all over again, to take the measure of his failure and weakness against the wideness of God's mercy. These two ways represent the choice before each one of us at the start of Holy Week. Have we the courage to deal with our betrayals by living into the way of forgiveness? Are we prepared to learn from the sacrament of failure? Do we view the church in the words of a former bishop of London as the trade union of the damned? Spoken in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us pray for the church and for the world, to the Lord, the King of glory. As the church rejoices in the triumphal entry of our Lord, grant to us also the spirit of repentance and sorrow for his suffering. May we at this holy time set forth the message of his salvation and lay our minds and wills before him as an offering of faith. In the Anglican Communion cycle of prayer, we're asked to pray today for the Church of the Province of the Indian Ocean, for the Most Reverend James Song, Archbishop of the Province of the Indian Ocean and the Bishop of the Seychelles. We ask God's blessing also on Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury. In the Diocese of Dunedin cycle of prayer, we pray for the Bluff Cooperating Parish in the search for a new spiritual leader, for the remnants of faith, the faith community in Brockville, and the winding up of that cooperative venture, and for this parish of St. Peter's Caversham, and for Brian, and for myself as its leaders, we ask God's blessing, of course, on Stephen, our bishop. Bring to a world that judges by outward signs of power and the wisdom to discern where true power lies in humility and love. Open the eyes of the rulers of the nations to see the one true king and be ready to serve at his command. We pray especially today for the people of New York, New Orleans, Iran, Northern Italy and Spain, where the coronavirus epidemic is at its worst. Give to us and to all those around us the vision of holiness in the daily scene of work and play. Help us to find in those we too easily take for granted the image of Christ the Lord, and to honour one another as those who seek to follow in his way. Have mercy on the sick and suffering, for whom the shadow of the cross is plainer at this time than the glory of the day, and to call out not in triumph, but in anguish. Give them relief from their affliction and the hope of new life. Especially we offer this prayer of Claire Christie, Paul Hill, John Steele, Rosemary Stock, Gillian Gordon, Anne Bowker, Jane Hill, Lorraine Mitchell and James Bunker. May the voices of those who will witness to God in this world now be blended with the eternal praise of the angels in heaven. May theirs be the song of triumph over sin and death, especially for those whose memorial occurs at this time, Robert Ray, Robert Walker, Basil Dickey, and Edward Welsh. We offer our prayers in the name of Christ, who has come to save his people. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right in thee. It is our joy and our salvation. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, at all times and at all places to give you thanks and praise through Christ, your only Son. You are the source of all life and goodness. Through your eternal word, you have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. 
Male and female, you created us. When we sinned and turned away, you called us back to yourself and gave your son to share our human nature. Out of love for us, he accepted death and lifted high upon the cross. He drew the whole world to himself. The tree of shame became the tree of glory. Where life was lost, there life has been restored. You raised him to life triumphant over death. You exalted him in glory. In him you have made us a holy people by sending upon us your holy and life-giving spirit. Therefore, with the faithful who rest in him, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All glory and thanksgiving to you, Holy Father. On the night before he died, your Son, Jesus Christ, took bread. When he had given you thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper he took the cup. When he had given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it to remember me. Therefore, loving God, recalling your great goodness to us in Christ, his suffering and death, his resurrection and ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate our redemption with this bread of life and this cup of salvation. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, which we offer through Christ our great high priest. Send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine which we receive may be to us the body and blood of Christ. And that we, filled with the Spirit's grace and power, may be renewed for the service of your kingdom. United in Christ with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, O God, in songs of everlasting praise. Jesus taught us to pray for the coming of the kingdom, and so we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. Christ crucified, draw you to himself to find in him 
a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope, and the assurance of sins forgiven. The blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always.